Good morning, and welcome to the Extending Pavement Life session as part of PennDOT's first ever Virtual Innovation Week. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Danielle Klinger Grumbine with PennDOT's Bureau of Innovations, and I will be your host for today's session. I'd like to kick things off today with a welcome from PennDOT Secretary Yasmin Gramian. Good morning and welcome to the first ever PennDOT Virtual Innovation Week. What a difference a year makes. Last year, we hosted our first ever Regional Innovation Day in Harrisburg for our PennDOT employees and local government representatives from the South, Central, and Southeastern parts of the state. We surpassed even our own expectations with over 500 attendees and received very positive feedback on how valuable this in-person information exchange was. This year, we plan to host another Regional Innovation Day in another part of the state. But then COVID-19 pandemic changed everything and we found ourselves quickly switching gears and developing plans for a virtual innovation week. Today, we find ourselves in a virtual world where we are physically separated, but counting on technology to allow us meaningful interaction. To add to these challenges, we also are experiencing additional financial challenges to our already stressed revenue concerns. Now more than ever, we must look to innovation to help stretch our limited resources to address our vast needs. And while we can't meet in person this year, we have a great week planned. We have lined up sessions over five days that will share advances across the transportation spectrum. You will hear from our Executive Deputy Secretary, George McCauley, Highway Administration Deputy Secretary, Melissa Batula, Multimodal Deputy Secretary, Jenny Granger, and Planning Deputy Secretary, Larry Shiflett. We have engaged our in-house and partner experts to present on construction, maintenance, planning, technology, safety, and traffic control issues, among others. I must say how proud I am of the PennDOT team for the way they have adapted to the virtual world. From the counties, the welcome centers, through the districts, and our far-flung driver and vehicle services staff and to central office, we have all met and exceeded expectations in maintaining much needed transportation services across the state. All of this while taking the necessary precautions to keep we and the people we serve as safe as possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear that innovation is extremely important as we navigate forward. These sessions demonstrate that we will not be deterred as we continue to accomplish all our missions to deliver the very best in transportation across Pennsylvania. We all face daunting challenges as we maintain and enhance the transportation assets that underpin our state's mobility and economy. COVID-19 has stiffened those challenges, especially regarding revenues. Thank you for taking time to join us this week we hope you'll find the sessions valuable and informative. Thank you, Secretary Gramian. Following each presentation today, there will be a facilitated question and answer period. If you have any questions for our speakers during today's session, please use the chat box on the right hand side of your screen to submit your questions. We will take questions in the order in which they were received. If we do not get to some of the questions during today's session, we will be working with our speakers following the event to get the questions answered and to send them to our participants. Throughout the Virtual Innovation Week, I also encourage you to view the more than 50 innovative tools, materials, applications, and technologies on display in our virtual exhibit hall. 
This exhibit hall is located on www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. These innovations are being used by federal, state, and local agencies and could help you do your job safer, better, faster, and maybe even save you some money. There is a contact form on the virtual exhibit hall page that will allow you to submit any questions you have about a particular innovation. And finally, before I get this session started and introduce our first speaker, please be advised that this session is being recorded. Following the event, we will be making all recorded sessions available on the event website. Again, www.pendot.gov forward slash innovation speak. Our first speaker today is Stephen Kozer. Stephen is the Pavement Testing and Asset Management Section Chief in PennDOT's Bureau of Maintenance and Operations. We'd like to welcome Steve to today's session. Good morning, everyone. And, you know, I don't see the slide deck. Oh, there it is. Okay, just as I said it, of course. Uh, good morning. So I'm going to present on hot pour mastic. So you'll see me refer to that as HPM throughout the uh, slides after the first couple slides where we spell it out. But it is a uh, a tool for our toolbox or toolkit uh, for extending our pavement life and maintaining our pavement. So the hot pour mastics effort was created by our state transportation innovation council who met uh, a while ago and formed a, uh, a maintenance tag or technical advisory group and the uh, the tag maintenance tag has representation from PennDOT's central office and engineering districts. Villanova. University, uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, Pennsylvania Asphalt uh, and Applicators Manufacturers Association, uh, the FHWA, PSAT, and uh, McCormick Taylor and Navarro and Wright are support. The process that we went through with developing a team, uh, which consisted of is from uh, PennDOT Central Office and Districts again, FHWA, PEMA, PSATS, and the Turnpike. So another team uh, worked on this process of evaluation. Initiation and then the initial evaluation was conducted through the, the stick tag, the stick and maintenance tag units. And then the, uh, the, the Hot Pour Mastics team got involved. And now shown as red on the slide because it's into the advanced stage. It just moved to that at the stick meeting in uh, July of this year. So to give you a little background on what is hot pour mastics or HPM, it is a hot applied, pourable, self-adhesive asphalt binder, which contains selected aggregates to provide for load bearing uh, and skid resistant characteristics. There are three basic components. One is the polymer modified asphalt binder, the asphalt, the, the black sticky stuff, if you will, uh, for a technical term, uh, specially selected aggregates, and a mastic melter, or sometimes referred to as a kelp, ke kettle, that is where the aggregate and asphalt binder gets mixed together. 
the agitation on this kind of uh, material is different from that used in crack sealing. The agitator or kettle uh, mixer is a, a horizontal agitation versus a vertical agitation, which is typically found in crack sealing. So what are some of the applications that it is useful for? Um, they're, they're, they vary widely. Uh, have it bolded as pavement seams or longitudinal joints and shoulder joints where you have failures or separations. And that's what Pemba, PennDOT has primarily used it for. Uh, and those cracks that, that are typically one inch or greater, you cannot use this because it has an aggregate in it that uh, would not fill a typical crack that should be filled with a crack sealant material. And likewise, a crack sealant material should not be used on cracks that are one inch or wider because they do not have the aggregate for the load bearing and to fill the uh, the void properly. Uh, and it will not work as well as this hot core mastic material. So filling, sealing, and repairing pavement distresses is what this material is used for. Uh, the other applications that it's used for are potholes. Uh, this could be for utility cuts, uh, right where you have raveled pavements. Uh, it can be used in a local environment or even in a state highway around manholes or drainage and culvert repair areas. Rough driving surfaces where you might have depressions or some ruts and cup pavements. And uh, leveling bridge approaches, which we have used it as, and bridge deck repairs. Um, so PennDOT has used it for the leveling bridge approaches, some transverse cracking, but as I said, primarily for longitudinal pavement joints or seams and shoulder joints or seams. So I want to now go into a uh, case study that was uh, we've done for a project that was done by our maintenance forces, our PennDOT department maintenance forces. And I'd like to acknowledge Ty Reed uh, from my office who actually was out on site at this uh, location while they were performing this. And he actually helped me with this part of the presentation as well as putting parts of the presentation together as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge Ty. This demo was construct, conduct, conducted on a asphalt road and it was, a, as you can see, a center line joint issue. Uh, it was overseen by the vendor who supplied the material and the uh, 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 equipment. So it was Craftco at the time. Uh, it was a 30 pound pre-mixed with aggregate uh, piece of material that went into the uh, melter or kettle and uh, have some pricing and an application rate information on the screen that you can see as well. So the, the observations were that the application was smooth and efficient. Uh, you can see the graphical picture of how it looks after it was immediately placed. Uh, it was about 2,000 pounds placed in a half hour, which is about 1,500 uh, pounds. was the equipment, or patcher two, and there was a drag box used. And those drag boxes can be variable in width. Uh, they can be as large as I've heard of four feet wide. So you can uh, address large areas if necessary, but typically they're, they're about a foot or so wide um, for the longitudinal joints. Uh, you can see the temperature range it was applied at. The, uh, the heating of the product was not efficient from the standpoint that we didn't realize how much equipment and how quickly you would use this material. So we we felt that we needed to have more than one piece of equipment ready to go as we started to apply this. And that was kind of a learning experience for PennDOT. So this was one of our first things that we, we did and uh, that was a learning experience for us. And it, you, so you don't have crews standing around. That, that was what the efficiency was about. Uh, it took an hour to reheat up about 2,000 more pounds of material in the melter or kettle. So that's why we wanted to uh, have more than one piece of equipment. So now it's it's two or three is what our typical maintenance uh, crews have been ordering and using uh, at the same time.
Uh, I seem to be stuck. Okay, so um, I'd like to go back one slide. Okay. There we go. So questions and concerns that came up during the application was, was as I said, downtime due to heating and proof of manpower sitting there, standing there waiting for material to get heated up. Uh, equipment rental or equipment uh, was rented. Uh, it was limited at the time. Uh, we understand it's better now. Uh, there are more pieces of equipment available. The manufacturers realize that yes, Pennsylvania is doing a lot of hot core mastic work. So there's more equipment that's been produced and is available. It was very limited at the time. So we were having to deal with a lot of scheduling issues with how to get equipment, this kind of equipment, because it is specialized uh, to be used. The equipment is available as well as the material on state contracts. And uh, again, we have the equipment with some question marks there about uh, purchasing of it. We have not done that. We have uh, basically rented these uh, hot pour mastic melters and kettles. So that that's something we would look at in the future to help with uh, the cost effectiveness of them, of the material application, or to maybe do it regionally and share it among several districts. So that's something that's still uh, up to be decided right now. OK, so how has it been performing? So um, this this material has been down for about a year as of uh, June of 2019. Uh, these pictures are relatively new. Uh, it's holding up very well, uh, so the performance seems to be very good. Uh, we're looking forward to the further applications within this district, which is District 3, which uh, is headquartered in Montoursville, Pennsylvania. So uh, that area of the state, north northeastern Pennsylvania, north to northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, that That's uh, the best kind of application you could hope for. Uh, we, we know the material stays flexible for quite some time, even after it's applied for multiple years. So that's a, a plus. Uh, and I will mention a, a, a negative about that uh, from some of the other states that we've talked to that uh, have used this material. When you try to recycle the asphalt pavement, they say you should mill out this section of highway and not use that material for for wrap for recycled as or reclaimed asphalt pavement because it is so uh, flexible and, and sticky, if you will. Uh, that it adheres to and gums up the equipment that's used to uh, mill off the wrap material. So you can use, if your pavement's in good condition in other places, you can use the rest of the material from the uh, pavement as a wrap product, but you should not use where you've had the uh, hot pour mastic because it, it gums up the equipment. Okay, so what have we uh, progressed through, through uh, time here recently? The uh, PennDOT's new products and innovation section, or MPI, has conditionally approved now as of uh, uh, earlier this year, um, four vendors in Bulletin 15 where you can acquire this material. There was only one vendor uh, previously, which was, as you saw, Craftco back in 2019. But as of beginning of 2020, we have four vendors now that can bid on this material. Uh, to apply it or to uh, provide it and or apply it. Uh, the, the approvals, those conditional approvals from NPI were based on uh, detailed correspondence where we got uh, in touch with up to 30 states. So we were finding other states that have used it for some time and we learned what their experience was. So it is not really a new application or material for pencil for you know the country, but for Pennsylvania it is. So that's the uh, advantage of the stick process is you find uh, innovations that have been successful and you take advantage of that so that you don't have to start from the beginning. And that's what we were able to do. Uh, also for these approvals, there was independent lab test results were re requested from the vendors um, so that they didn't just give us their results, but we also got independent lab tests that they had somebody else verify the uh, material testing. 
Uh, our our uh, laboratory did some verification tests. We looked at the gradations of the aggregates in the uh, highly polymer modified asphalt binder. And then uh, quality control plans from the manufacturers were also obtained and, and used in the process. And ASTM actually came out with a national standard for hot pour mastics in January this year. There was no national standard, so everybody had their own specifications to follow previously. So what are we going to do in the future? Well, we're going to monitor the performance for two years uh, because of the conditional approvals. Uh, we're in the process of developing more stringent use guidelines to help our forces how to apply it and how to be safe with that application. And we're going to update our, our maintenance manual or our pub 23. There's a chapter seven uh, called paved surfaces, and we're expecting to put a new section on hot form mastics or HPM in that uh, chapter of the pub. So at this time, I'll entertain any questions that have come in. Thank you, Steve. Again, if you have any questions for Steve, please submit them in the chat box, which is located on the right hand of your screen. Let's check the chat box. Um, Dan, do we have any questions for Steve? Yes, uh, Steve, the first question. Ergonomically, Having an employee dragging a box over hot material and straddling their body over it with arms extended forward could cause muscle strain and back injuries. Is there any alternative method to move or drag the material box into position to lower this injury tendency? Okay. Um, I would say yes, there is. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, case study that we had, I believe that was a box that was chained to the back of the equipment. It said a Craftco Patcher 2 with a drag box chained to the patcher. It was 10 to 12 inch width. Um, they also could be using a, a hot iron to smooth out any edges where the, uh, you know, to make it very close to the same height of the pavement so that you don't have like a bump when you drive over it after it cures. Uh, there is some safety guidance that we had uh, established for our our uh, work crews, our department force work crews, and that was sent out to to those folks uh, through a memo that we transmitted about a year plus over a year ago. Um, does, does that answer your question, Larry? Steve, we'll, we'll have to wait and see if we have any follow up from that one. The next okay. question uh, involves a statement you made with uh, the mastic material gumming up equipment. What equipment does the mastic material gum up? The milling equipment in the field or the workings at the plant, which when it should be recycled? We've heard primarily from the other states that have gone through the cycle where they've had it out there for many years, let's say, you know, five, six, seven years. It was the the actual milling equipment, so it was gumming up that equipment, not in the plant. We have not heard that. I mean, that's a possibility, but that's not what we've heard. Uh, we'll take a couple more here. Uh, do you have a total cost for this operation? Um, that's that's quite variable we believe because the uh you know the lack of equipment at first and now there is more equipment available the material cost i think i had identified on the one slide for the case study was 65 cents a pound uh, so that's a material cost and then you know figuring out your uh your manpower costs uh is also something else that you know it's kind of difficult to do at this stage and we believe with more and more of it being used the pricing and costs are going to come down, and we don't th feel that it's at a stabilized uh, price yet to say that, yeah, this is what you should expect. Uh, it is not cheap, I can say that, but it, when you compare it to uh, the cost of, you know, putting some kind of treatment over the pavement uh, or milling it up and doing something else, it's it's very cost effective. We have looked at it from that perspective. 
OK, we're going to get to two more here. Uh, the next question, was there an aggregate spread on the surface of the HMA? And I take it as that's hot mix asphalt. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that was hot mix asphalt. There, there is what's called a topping aggregate that could be placed on top. It does not have to be because there is aggregate in this material, but uh, we would recommend that it be placed and it could be put on by hand. Uh, it's just an aggregate that's put on as it's curing and before it does cure, um, and that's by cooling is what I mean by curing, uh, to a pavement temperature that you can actually drive over. But yes, I think it would be highly recommended to put a topping aggregate on top. It's a fine aggregate, like quarter inch size uh, aggregate. And the last question we'll get to before we uh, switch over to the next presentation. Any issues with applying pavement marking materials to the HPM? Yeah, we we would prefer that it not be in in the uh, where the pavement markings would go over top, but you know, I think as long as you put the uh, topping aggregate on top uh, and speaking with the vendors, we haven't experienced any issues with that. Um, but, you know, it is a uh, an asphaltic material that uh, might not adhere as easily or as good, uh, but we haven't heard any negatives about it. So uh, other states have been able to paint over it and we would just suggest that the topping aggregate be placed because that would help with uh, adherence from the uh, paint. We're actually going to get one more in here. Um, so Steve, how many years have other states found the material to stay flexible and work as intended? Uh, I'd have to go back and look at our database that we select, you know, used to select the 30 states we spoke to, but um, I don't have a, a good answer right off the top of my head, although it is many years. Um, you could probably get up to 10 years depending on the uh, the kind of uh, failure you had and if there is any kind of movement, but it does stay flexible like for the life of the pavement. So we're, we're hoping to get like five, six years, four or five, six years out of any application because that allows us to plan and program for another project to repair the whole pavement, not just the, the uh, basically the longitudinal joint failures. And with our new longitudinal joint specs, we, we believe that that will be a great improvement to the future, and we would hope we would not have these kinds of repairs needed, but it's going to take many, many years to get to that point because those pavements have been just placed recently. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Okay, our next speaker for today is Kevin Nagy. Uh, Kevin is the materials engineer in PennDOT's District 9, and we'd like to welcome Kevin to our virtual innovation week. Kevin? I apologize. Yeah, there you go. We're gonna we're gonna try that again. It looks like <laughs> you're stuck there on on uh, mute. So I'm gonna give you control again. Okay. Apologize. I was talking. I'm, I'm, I thought I was unmuted. So back up. There you go. Oh, good morning. Hopefully you can hear me now. <laughs> um. Again, I apologize for being on mute. I thought I was off. Um, fiber reinforced polymer patching materials. Um is what I'm going to discuss here this morning. 
Uh, it's basically a hot applied flexible concrete repair we typically use for our concrete roadways. So the reason we started looking into partial depth, um, a, a replacement or something better for our concrete partial depth repairs was typically our repair areas are at moving joints or corners that tend to crack and debond due to movement of the adjacent concrete, whether it be thermal movement um, or lack of support underneath. So some of the advantages of the fiber reinforced um, patching material, uh, it's pre-blended with aggregate. It comes in a bagged, uh, it's a bag product that can be shipped on pallets. Uh, it's polymer and fiber modified mix, flowable and pourable, can be extended with aggregate. It's flexible while providing resistance to deformation, excellent adhesion, um, no, no compressive or tensile stress on the surrounding pavement, which is which is huge when it's confined in a, a concrete pavement. And it's also waterproof and voidless. The two bags over here that you can see on the right hand side, uh, those are both uh, the Fibercrete G and the Craftco Techcrete are both Bulletin 15 approved materials. So they are in our approved um, Bulletin 15 for use in, in, in PennDOT projects. So flexible versus rigid. So we have Gumby here on the left. He's nice and flexible. That's kind of like this material. And on the right, we have rigid, which unfortunately maybe someone has experienced this with their cell phone, which is not a fun thing. So where to use? Um, typically, we use these on, again, concrete pavements where we have either longitudinal repair areas, corner breaks, partial depth repairs, um, some potholes. Um, you can see that poor bicyclist got stuck going for a ride. I don't know why he's riding on a, a four lane, but and to the right of that, you can see the repair that was done, um, a similar repair in a longitudinal joint that had separated. And the middle of the page down at the bottom is a basically a four corner um, slab brush that we would, we would see, um, and I'm sure many of others have seen. Um, and that's where this material really shines is being flexible and being able to move with those four corners. So I'm going to run you through the repair procedure um, rather quickly because I do have a, a video that hopefully plays uh, that I'll walk you through the installation by video as well. But this is on the left, the machine that basically heats and agitates the material that comes in the, the bags that I previously shown. So they charge at in the morning, try to get the material up to about 300 degrees or plus. Um, similar to a normal small repair, we have to clean, uh, chip out, and clean, and, pr and prime the area prior to uh, applying this material. And there you can see the hot material coming out of the machine on the right hand picture into the spall repair. So, we also, when we get above uh, about an inch, inch and a half depth, we add a bulking stone to give it some rigidity. So in the middle picture here, um, you can see that hot material has already been applied to that patch. Now they're applying this bulking stone. And that bulking stone is typically tamped in a little bit, and then another lift of hot material is added to bring it to grade. And here you can see this gentleman's finishing the patch with the hot iron um, to grade. And then the next thing is Steve mentioned with the, the mastic, um, there is a topping stone that is applied to this um, repair area as well. 
Here they are applying the the topping and friction stain. Here's the patch on the right um, with the excess stone. Um, they'll typically come back in about an hour to remove that if we're under lane closure. Um, depending on ambient temperature, this material is actually ready to open to traffic within an hour or two. And there's the finished patch after the excess is removed. Um, and you can see it blends in with the surrounding concrete. It can be diamond ground, uh, which was the case on this project that we uh, first did about uh, four and a half, five years ago. Still in place today, still uh, performing very well. So here is a video. You can see they've prepped the concrete surface, cleaned it. We would typically square that off a little more, but this came from um, one of the suppliers. They'll lay the bags of uh, of the pre bag material up there to heat up, and then it gets dumped into the basically the hot box hub. And you can see it coming down the machine here. They're loading it into a little portable, uh, what I call portable hot box. And this allows them, it's preheated, it has its own propane heater. But they can move around to do repairs like this without having to back that machine in and out. Um, so it saves them a lot of time with that and safety. There they're applying the first lift of material, of hot material. As you can see, this repair was well, well over two inches in depth. So we keep that first lift of material, of the hot material, a little bit low. They're adding the bulking stone. That just gives it a, an aggregate skeleton and, and a little bit of uh, helps with rigidity at the um, for, for traffic once it's in place. You can see all the tools are very hot. There's actually a firebox on the side of that big machine that keeps everything nice and hot. You'll see them actually switching irons out once one gets cold. Here he's applying the final lift over top of the balking stone. Very important to seal all the edges to keep water water out. You can see by the gentleman's feet there, they already started applying the friction stone. Again, just finishing a repair to grade. And completing it with the topping stand. So with that, I will answer any questions if there are any, Danielle or Dan. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, again, if anyone has any questions for Kevin, please enter them into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we'll go to Dan now to see if we do have any questions. Kevin, how long until uh, traffic can, it can be open to traffic? Uh, so it's, it depends on ambient conditions. Um, typically, Typically, one hour to two hours. Um, so if it's in a hotter day, it's going to, you know, if you're 90 degrees, it's going to be um, closer to that two-hour time frame. Um, but for the most part, uh, about an hour to hour and a half is is the typical typical range.
Next question. Are there products available in Bulletin 15? Uh, yes. The two currently that, that I'm aware of um, is the Fibercrete G and also the Craftco Techcrete. And then is this in any specifications? Um, currently, we we have it in a special provision that we use um, and some, have shared with some surrounding districts. Um, it was going to be try to be included with the 408 2020 rewrite. Um, however, it, it did not make that that section, um, but there is future plans to include it into our section 525, which is our um, partial depth repair section in, in the publication 408. Are there any temperature restrictions with air and or surface? Um, they they can actually get around that somewhat by heating the concrete, but they yeah they typically do not like uh, they don't like to go much below 35 degrees. Um, some of those pictures that I had taken there was was a pretty cool day. I think I had right around uh, 41 degrees on my thermometer in my car, so. Um, that's why they were preheating um, all the aggregate so it would, you know, be able to settle down into the patch and, and um, they ran the material a little bit hotter that day as well. Next question, is all the additional propane wand heating necessary in the summer months? Uh, yes, it, it's basically it's simple as a little firebox that's on the side of that machine. Uh, if not, it will. That stuff is so sticky um, that once it starts to to cool it all, it it will stick to the to the, the those tools. And the last question, is there any issue with equipment availability? Um, it's become for us, it has not been an issue. Um, there's a it appears to be more of a um, equipment market, I'll say, towards the western part of the state, uh, for us anyway. Um, but we have not had I issues getting it when we, you know, for on our contract work. Um, I'm sure it's it's available for rent um, through the manufacturer that they they basically have train subs that uh, have these that have this equipment available for rent. There are no more questions. OK, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Our next two speakers are Joshua Freeman, who is the pavement design engineer in PennDOT's Bureau of Project Delivery, and Scott Cressman, who is the geotechnical engineer in PennDOT's District 5. We want to welcome Josh and Scott. Um, we'll go through both of their presentations today and then we will open it up to questions. So, um, Josh. Good morning. Well, my name is Joshua Freeman. I work in central office um, downtown Harrisburg and I'm going to talk to you today about bonded concrete overlays. So a bonded concrete overlay is used for a couple different reasons. Um, when you want to add structural capacity or increase the strength of your pavement on top of the existing pavement that's already in place. You can also use it to eliminate surface distresses if you have a lot of heavy truck traffic that's stopping, idling, turning, that's causing shoving, rutting, um, you know, distresses on that are on top that aren't affecting the base. And you want to have an existing pavement that's in good structural condition that's going to be able to support the concrete overlay that you're going to place on top. 
So this is an image of a before and after. So in the before case, you can see the asphalt pavement with the different distresses that I was describing earlier. Um, you can see the rutting potholes, localized fatigue cracks, bleeding, shoving, slippage. And then you're going to go through your surface preparation where you're going to mill off some of the asphalt, make some repairs, um, and then you're going to place about two to six inches of a bonded concrete overlay and use square panels without any type of steel reinforcement or load transfer devices. Uh, and you're going to solely rely on concrete, the concrete aggregate interlock. Uh, some states have used fiber within the mix uh, and the help control cracking. When we do have some projects where we've used fibers in the past. Um, we in central office believe it's a, a good practice to use with these thinner concrete layers. Uh, another kind of bonded concrete overlays is placing on top of concrete. So you can see here where we've got some random cracking, spalling, transverse cracking, scaling, and some partial depth patches that are failing as well. There is a little bit more involved with preparing the surface on a concrete pavement. Uh, in most cases, you're going to need to go in and make full depth patches and clean the surface with either water blasting, shot blasting, to get rid of any loose concrete material that, that might be on top. Uh, the bond here is very, very important that the new concrete creates that uh, physical bond with the old concrete because then it will become one slab once it's done and you need to make sure everything goes correct when doing this type of treatment. Um, with these types of overlays, you're going to match the transverse and longitudinal joints exactly, and any cracks or patch joints that may have been created during your surface preparation or that are already in place. And you will saw the entire way through the new concrete overlay down to the existing to ensure that you get that joint recreated in the new overlay to help prevent any chance that it may debond that new concrete layer. This is a table from PennDOT's publication 242, the Payment Policy Manual. In here, we go over the dimensions of bonded concrete overlays over concrete, thin bonded concrete over asphalt, bonded concrete over asphalt, and also unbonded, which Scott's going to cover. Uh, we have specifications in Pub 408 uh, that cover the work for each one of these. Uh, the thin bonded is in process of being updated to a new specification uh, where we're improving the language that's been in there for over 30 years. Um, and we've got some notes there on the bottom about how you want to space the joints. Um, we want to make sure that we're not putting any of the longitudinal joints in the wheel path of the traffic. We have that from other states that have done that, where it's just deteriorated the overlay a lot quicker than what was expected. And it's a best practice to keep that longitudinal joint out of the wheel path. A uh, general rule of thumb for these thinner concrete pavements is that you want the same longitudinal transverse spacing and feet to match up with the inches of the depth. So if you have a six inch concrete overlay 
on asphalt, you're going to do six by six foot panels. If it's five inches, you could also do six by six foot. Um, if you're around three inches, you're going to do three by three and so on. But we want to try to avoid the two and four by four, two by two and four by four to avoid the longitudinal joint in the wheel path. Locations for use. Uh, we have intersections where I was talking about before with the turning movements. Any type of steep grades where you have trucks coming down that have to break. Any areas where you have previously had rutting, shoving, or slippage. And if you have around 2,500 easels per day, equivalent single axle loads, that would be a good indicator to consider using a concrete overlay versus trying to replace the asphalt overlay, um, even sometimes with polymers. Um, we've seen some locations where it just isn't holding up um, and maintenance has to go back out and make repairs. And uh, definitely consider it in high traffic, high truck areas, an example of being an industrial park. These are some locations in District 12 where uh, bonded concrete on asphalt overlays have been used. Uh, there's also one project with a bonded concrete on concrete, and I'm going to go over these really briefly. Those are the ECMS numbers if you want to ever want to look up um, more details. So one of the first ones in District 12 was a four inch bonded concrete on asphalt. It's also called a white topping. Here they did use four by four foot panels and it actually performed really well. Um, we didn't have any issues. Uh, it was built in 2005, so that's been 15 years of service and they haven't made any repairs yet to it. There is some cracking around some manholes. Uh, but otherwise, it's still bonded to the asphalt and holding very, holding up very well. Uh, we're looking about 300 trucks a day. This was a pilot project for our current specification in the 408. Uh, it was done down there by the Penn State campus in Fayette County. It's a six inch bonded concrete on asphalt using six by six foot panels. They milled off four and a half inches of asphalt and it was built in 2010 and we're looking at about 1200 trucks per day. And they haven't done any maintenance work yet to date. Uh, this was done with asphalt shoulders. I will mention that that's a lesson learned that with these types of concrete overlays, it's we get better performance when the shoulders also concrete. Um, what happens is the asphalt shoulder is not supporting the concrete overlay as well. And what we're seeing is some type some damage that's occurring uh, to the outside panel. And it's actually cracking and and falling away but there are some other underlying issues that could be helping it to accelerate this was the second bcoa project that was done the last project was two miles of four lane this was the second project of two miles of four lanes same type of scope they built it in 2015, milled six inches asphalt and placed six inches of concrete with six by six foot panels. We're looking at around 900 trucks per day and no maintenance has been done yet. This project had a bonded concrete on concrete treatment done. It was a change in construction. Instead of placing four and a half inches of asphalt, the contractor proposed to place four and a half inches of concrete on top of the old jointed reinforced concrete pavement 
after they removed a three inch asphalt overlay. So it was built in 2016, 2017. Uh, again, another four lane project. And we're looking at about 1200 trucks per day. And the takeaway here is that preparation is key and just getting that surface prepared and making sure all the conditions are correct when placing that new concrete on top. Um, they have had some cracking on this project uh, that they're looking into and looks like there are some small areas of debonding that they need to address. Well, some lessons learned, best practices. So bonded concrete on concrete should be the right location and construction methods. And that means that you have an area that is going to be able to support the new concrete. You know, consider the condition of your concrete pavement, take cores, understand what's going on with that existing pavement and make sure that it's going to hold up to the treatment that you're applying and you're going to get the life out of it that you're expecting. Longitudinal joints should be arranged to avoid the wheel path. I've covered that. Seal joints to prevent moisture and water intrusion. So once your concrete overlays down, Pennsylvania's best practice is to seal all joints to prevent water from getting in and getting down, possibly um, jeopardizing that bond that's created between the concrete and the asphalt or the concrete and concrete. Uh, we don't want that to freeze and to separate and cause issues. Utilize concrete shoulders over asphalt. And tie bars should be used at the longitudinal joints to prevent separation. So this was a, a lesson learned where we're finding that uh, some steel would be beneficial at the longitudinal joints to hold the pavement together. Uh, especially if you have that unsupported edge uh, where you you don't have any curb or concrete on the shoulder. Here's some resources that are free for use. Uh, the Concrete Pavement Tech Center has a guide. They're working on their fourth edition that will be coming out soon. Uh, you can visit their website to download that as a PDF. Uh, they're also available for any type of support. Just reach out to them and they will get back to you. They have a lot of expertise from around the country and they've seen it all. Our publication 242 pavement policy manual covers all the different types of overlay treatments. Pub 408 specifications manual covers all the work. And the University of Pittsburgh has developed a BCOA ME, which is mechanistic empirical for the bonded concrete on asphalt pavement design method. I recommend you take a look at it if you are considering this type of treatment to make sure that the depth that you want to use is adequate for the conditions of your project. Uh, it's available here at this website. It's no cost. It's available to the public it was created by Dr. Julie Vandenbosch, who's done a lot of work with us uh, or with the department and continues to do excellent work with us. And I'd recommend that you take a look at that. And I'd like to give a shout out to Stacy Lloyd, our pavement management engineer in District 12, who put this presentation together. Um, Stacy's been doing a great job as a pavement engineer there. And I just want to thank her for her great work. And now I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're going to go in these presentation next, and then we'll take the three both at the end. Okay, welcome, Scott. Morning. So as Danielle said, um, Josh covered the bonded concrete overlays. I'm going to cover the unbonded concrete overlays. Um, the uh, District Geotechnical Engineer in District 5. Um, I also oversee the uh, pavement management section. Um, and after some use of the projects, I've become pretty familiar with this uh, type of treatment.
So just some basic information about the unbonded concrete overlays. Um, the design process is a little bit different from the bonded concrete overlay that Josh was talking about. Um, the unbonded functions as a new concrete pavement, um, and actually the design process is very similar to the uh, procedure when going through um, either new bituminous or new concrete pavements. Um, unbonded concrete overlays add structural capacity um, and they extend pavement life while you reduce excavation. Um, that's a very big feature. If you have projects where you can't close lanes or you can't detour or excavation is going to be tricky or there's no space for the waste material um, and the conditions are proper for the unbonded overlay. Uh, it's a very good treatment to reduce all those ancillary um, procedures. Um, one thing that is different between the bonded concrete overlays, unbonded require minimal repairs. Um, if anything, you're going to be taking off any kind of bituminous overlays, doing some patching here and there, maybe some joint sealing, but for the most part, um, you leave the existing section alone and that sort of functions independently. And then getting into that, um, a bond breaking inner layer is placed to allow the new pavement to function as its own section. And essentially the old pavement becomes a very high quality engineered base. Um, the inner layer began with asphalt and now uh, there's been a lot of research done moving into a geotextile inner layer. Um, as I said before, uh, the inner layer prevents any kind of faulting or any kind of issues with the existing to come through. And a real big thing with the unbonded is that it promotes positive drainage. Um, and I'll get into some of that, but the a, a key for when you're doing these designs is to make sure that you have either upgraded or um, very well performing drainage throughout the project corridor. So this is a, a table from um, the concrete overlay manual. Um, you can see the difference in treatments. Uh, the bonded concrete generally functions in the good to fair um, and it's preventative maintenance to minor rehab where the unbonded concrete functions anywhere from good all the way down to deteriorated. Um, and it can actually, as I said before, it can actually um, function in areas where reconstruction is needed, um, but there are some ways to get around any of the ancillary um, constraints like, you know, um, any of the excavation or any kind of traffic control issues. So the same graphics as what Josh had. Uh, this one is for unbonded concrete over concrete. Um, the first section you can see all of the different distresses here. A um, bunch of different things you can have on the existing section and really unless the concrete um, is experiencing ASR or it's very, very faulted, um, similar to here to the uh, shattered slabs. If you have loss of base support and the, the slabs just take a beating, um, there's not too much that you have to do to it. Uh, you'll have some small repairs here. Um, we did a little bit of spalling on our project and actually as the graphic shows, you can remove slabs and just replace it with a, a large aggregate base. Um, the inner layer is then placed. Any kind of new drainage or upgraded drainage is placed on the outside of the pavement for positive drainage and the overlay is placed on top of it. Similar for asphalt pavements, um, a lot of major distresses on the um, existing asphalt section can be managed um, depending on the condition, same thing as the bonded, but if there are widespread issues and say deep running or shoving, um, it's probably easier to go through and just mill some of that off instead of trying to repair it. Um, the worst areas will get repairs. You might have some kind of crack sealing or 
um, some minor uh, partial width repairs, not really, you know, full lane width repairs to be done. And then the unbonded comes through just like on the on the concrete, it's paved through. Similar table is what Josh had spoken about. Um, I've highlighted the unbonded minimum and maximum thicknesses. Um, the slab joint spacing is more similar to the uh, traditional concrete pavements. Um, the project example that I'll be showing, uh, we actually used uh, 12 by 15s just because of our thickness. Um, you do not need to match the existing joints. That was one thing that we had um, some concerns about with trying to match up the joint spacing of the new to the old. You don't need to do that because that bond breaking inner layer is functioning to reduce the stress cracks coming through. So just going through the, the project that we did here in District 5, uh, we had a section of, um, call it major rehab that we were looking at on I-81 in Schuylkill County. Um, we ran a couple different cost analyses, um, anywhere from crack or break in seat. We considered the unbonded full depth asphalt and full depth concrete. Uh, you can see in the cost comparison there, the unbonded overlay came in as the lowest cost option. And a lot of that had to do with the uh, reduction and almost elimination of all the um, class one excavation for the project. So we really didn't have to haul anything out. The section did have a bituminous overlay on the existing concrete slabs. So we milled that off and then placed a bond breaker. That was really the only material removal that we had. Um, project started in 2014, lasted full three construction seasons and then it went into 2018 just for some ancillary cleanup items that we had. So here's the, the typical section of what the unbonded looks like on plans. Um, you can see here the existing payment section has been called out. So uh, this section of I-81 was nine inches of sub base and a 10 inch concrete pave. We came in and we placed um, an inch of super pave and then we put an eight inch thick section over. Um, and then in some areas with super elevations or transitions, the unbonded did get thicker. Um, the shoulders then were reconstructed as well. And those were reconstructed based on the pub 242 standards with treated permeable base course and then sub base underneath. Um, guide rail was added and we also rock armored and built up the slopes just to account for the change in grade. Here's some project photos. Uh, the photo on the left is showing the milled concrete surface. Um, you can see the lanes there. We excavated out on the shoulders and are preparing to uh, place the sub base and treated perm in there. Um, you can see in this section, if we would be going through with a traditional uh, preservation or rehab project, we would have a lot of patching through here. This is one of the only areas that we did have a full depth patch. Um, we did include some patching where we had new cross pipes put in, but for the most part, it, the existing concrete didn't really receive too many um, patches or treatments other than things that are were deteriorated as bad as this. Um, the right picture shows the placement of the uh, super pave inner layer, and you can see on the shoulder that we're up to grade with the um, treated permeable base course. So everything is at level grade, and then we're bringing the inner layer up, and then we'll be able to pave um, out to out. So photo on the left here, the crews are getting ready uh, for concrete placement. Um, they're putting their load transfer units in, the dowel baskets. Um, one thing that we had noted here, um, something that had come up in, in construction is how to fasten the, the load transfer units to the existing slab. Um, and I don't know if it's going to be clear here, but we used a Hilti gun with straps and we just shot the straps in and that way that kept the load transfer units in place 
as the slip form paver came across. Uh, the next photo, uh, we're going from a, a transition of full depth. Um, we did have to transition leading into at grade structures, and we did have a couple overpass structures. You can see one in the background. Um, so we did have transition areas there, but it worked out the same way. Um, just prepared the two different surfaces, and then the slip form paver just came through and paved continuous. So just some lessons learned and best practices from our experience with the project. Um, key thing is to either include accurate survey information um, ahead of time or include items during construction uh, for survey to be taken. Um, need to map out any of those transition areas like I'd spoken to in and out of structures, uh, cross slope elevations, super elevations, um, anything that needs to become up to design standards. Um, again, with the elevation increase, um, just make sure that there's enough run out to your swales, slope grades. Um, you're going to have to have reset or reinstall guide rail uh, just because of that, that change. So you'll, you'll lose your um, height of the rail there. Um, and then something that had come up from one of the things that we'd experienced. Um, We'd spoken with central office and the CP tech center, and we're recommending um, modifying the dowel bar layout when you're trying to tie full depth shoulders into the existing section where you're doing the unbonded overlay. Um, that leads me to one of the issues that we encountered here. So the dowel bar layout that we had matched as if we were going through with full depth um but one of the conditions that occurred was the full depth shoulders had such a high modulus on either side of the existing slab and the bond breaker was performing as expected on the lanes that we actually had a clamping effect that caused some stress cracks um, on the longitudinal joints and the transverse joints at the shoulders um, as you can see here this this drawing from one of the uh, reports that the tech center had done for us shows the um, tension at the middle of the slab where we do have in between the two lanes pulling out towards the shoulders because the shoulders are, are so strong through there. Um, so one of the recommendations that come in to either modify your joint spacing there or actually leave the, the shoulders um, untied to the existing slabs. So to wrap things up, um, as Josh had said, the concrete overlay guide, uh, free download from www.cptechcenter.org. Um, the National Concrete Pavement Tech Center um, was a very big resource for us. Uh, we had a lot of questions for them and very knowledgeable. They, they've assisted with a bunch of sections um, throughout the region here and even nation. Um, this the treatment is very big in Texas and, and in the South, so there's a lot of good resources that have come out from all those projects there. Um, for projects here in PennDOT, uh, we have to follow the 242 payment policy manual and the 408 for the specifications. So thank you. That's all that I have. Um, Danielle will open to questions. Sure, thank you very much, Scott. Um, I do believe we have a few questions from the audience, so I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Does this require the use of a paver or bid well machine? So for bonded concrete overlays, you for the projects where you're doing long distances, you're going to want to use a concrete paver. Um, I can't say I've seen anyone use a bidwell machine. I have seen them being poured in place where you have short areas or maybe just one lane width wide where you just milled out that asphalt section. You could pour it in and level it off and then apply your surface without using a paver, you know, if you're doing just a couple hundred feet. So I would say concrete paver is the way to go if you're doing a larger project. Otherwise, you're just 
going to pour it and level it off by hand. I think just to add for the for the unbonded, those are typically placed with a slip form paper, as you saw in the in the photos. It's more of a traditional process. Next question. With that many saw cut joints, what is the long term expected crack sealing needs? Yeah, so there are more joints with the shorter jointed concrete pavements. Um, they're sealed as, as you normally would seal them. I know there is some movement within the department to move away from the backer rod and, and just do a saw cut and a hot pour to seal the joints. So if it comes to a, a, a time during the project where you need to clean and seal those joints down the road, you know, 10, 15 years, I would put a project together and have that done. I wouldn't recommend that you have maintenance use their crack sealing machine. It's just going to look not as polished. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting the joint filler down into the joint and not just placing it on top. I think that'll lead to the joint material being removed. Does this require testing of concrete? So if you're going to, I, I'm going to take that as asking about the testing of existing concrete. So with an existing concrete pavement, you do want to take cores. You want to know if there's any deterioration on the bottom of your concrete, if there's any further distresses, you know, rather than what you see on the surface. Um, there are methods where you can sound the surface of the concrete to make sure you're removing any bad concrete that's not going to help the bond uh, by dragging trains or, you know, sounding it with a hammer. I know that's typically not ideal. Um, during the shop blasting process, you're going to remove a lot of the micro cracks uh, from the surface and any loose concrete during that process. Um, th that's the most that you're probably going to need to do as far as testing for that type of treatment. If you're talking about testing the concrete after it's being been placed, there is a um, a pull test that's done to test the bond strength between the concrete and the old concrete with the concrete on top of asphalt. They take cores to ensure that it's bonded, but there's no test that's done. Okay, last question we'll take right now. Uh, any issues with using unbonded uh, in, in curbed sections? I'd say um, you have to consider the, the height of the overlay. Um, any kind of increase in your, um, your grade or your roadway profile. Uh, if you have a curb section and you're not proposing to reconstruct the curb through there, um, I'd look at probably the bonded concrete overlay. Um, but if you do have the elevation that you can raise the road, um, it's a viable treatment. Uh, again, though, you want to make sure that you have um, good drainage underneath as well, because if the water gets trapped, and as with all concrete pavements, you'll have some issues. Okay, my thanks to both Josh and Scott for their presentation today. Our next speaker is Dean Paletti. Uh, Dean is the maintenance services engineer in PennDOT's District 11. Welcome, Dean. Thank you, Danielle. As Danielle mentioned, I am the maintenance services engineer here in PennDOT District 11. And this morning, I'm going to talk about a longitudinal joint repair project that we did utilizing microsurfacing on one of our interstates. The longitudinal joint repair we did was on I-79 in Lawrence County. The project scope that we did was for the repairing the northbound and southbound outer shoulder longitudinal joints. Uh, we did about nine miles of repair, but roughly four and a half miles in either direction. Uh, the depth of repair ranged from one inch deep to four inches deep. 
It took about three days to complete both uh, northbound and southbound directions. The total cost for the repair was $115,000, and the contractor that uh, did the repairs was Sukut. So this is what a, the, a photo of the uh, finished product looks like. Um, so it's roughly around a two foot wide uh, joint seal um, that we did on the, the failing joints. Um, in the left of the photo, you'll see more of a, a coarse aggregate type material. That is the first lift of the microsurfacing. And the second lift is more of a fine aggregate that you'll see as the finished product. Um, they stagger the joints slightly when they do this. So here's some before photos before we did any repairs. Uh, the photo on the left shows severe deterioration of the longitudinal joint, uh, ranging anywhere from, from one inch wide to about eight inches wide at the widest points. Um, as I mentioned, about one to four inches in depth. Uh, the photo on the right is also a typical um, uh, joint that we have on the interstate um, that's open where the, the joint is too wide to seal with um, regular crack sealing material. And uh, originally we were going through this section uh, to try to crack seal this, and this is one of the brought to our attention that, that the joints were, were well beyond a, a crack sealing repair and we needed to do something differently. So we actually work ordered this microsurfacing repair into our crack sealing contract. Uh, the first step uh, when doing the microsurfacing is to prepare the surface. So we had to remove all the organic and foreign material uh, with compressed air, power broom, and by hand. So any material, any vegetation or any existing joint sealing material needed to be removed before we could do the microsurfacing application. Um, any very tightly adherent existing joint sealing material that was there at the bottom of the voids, um, if it was tightly adherent, it wasn't pulling off the substrate, we did leave that in. Uh, we were not allowed to have any surface moisture, so if there was any standing water in the joints before we did the microsurfacing application, we needed to remove it with a propane torch. Some very minor small aggregate is acceptable, but the contractor did a great job in blowing out the, the joint prior to the microsurfacing application. And then you either need to perform pavement marking eradication or use a tack coat application prior to doing the microsurfacing to cover up the paint line so you get good adhesion. Um, in our case, we decided to go with a tack coat. Um, it was a very cost effective way, and then it was able to, to maintain the interstate uh, paint lines a, a lot longer than it would be to eradicate the paint lines. Um, then just for our inspection staff, the, the, uh, they inspected all the surface preparation and tack coat prior to the operation commencing, but this operation moves extremely fast and it's difficult for the inspectors to keep up on foot. So they placed about nine miles each day um, that they did this. So there was quite a, quite a bit of walking that our inspection staff had to do. Apologize, looks like the presentation's got a little bit of a snag here. Okay, well, as I mentioned, the operation moves about three to five miles an hour. Uh, for temperatures, you need to have about 50 degrees and rising for the placement of the material. Uh, you place it in two lifts. The, the first lift uses a coarse sand, primarily to fill the voids. Um, since we did have such large voids, we did have to do this, these two applications. Um, so the first lift brings it up almost to the surface. And then the second lift uses a fine sand, and that's what creates the smooth surface and brings everything flush at the end. Um, so you have a nice finished uh, smooth product. The lifts are not placed on the same consecutive work day. They place these on, on separate days. Um, and the seams are not to have any ridges, and then you want the overlap to be less than four inches. Um, so greater, you can't have any overlap greater than four inches, excuse me. So you offset the joint slightly so you don't create a lip that when water is trying to flow off the interstate, it's not going to catch on that lip and lay right at the edge line. So we stagger those just slightly to, to prevent uh, drainage from uh, preventing water from ponding. This is a, a very low viscosity material. It flows very easily and it fills the void, so it's almost a self-leveling type material. The product sets in about one to four hours, so we're actually able to open to traffic the same day 
sets very quickly, just depending on temperature and how de how deep the repair is. And it's fully cured in about 24 hours. The equipment that we used was a, a continuous feed paver with a two foot box. It carries the emulsion, cement, the aggregate and water all on the same machine. Um, suit coat utilized four support units. There were triaxle type units that continuously fed the paver with aggregate. And then the aggregate was fed through a screening plant uh, using a 3 8 inch screen before being loaded in the support units. Um, we actually had them set up in one of our PennDOT maintenance yards just south of the project where they went ahead and screened all the aggregate prior to the operation. So they were able to have a smooth um, uh, seamless uh, application. A uh, pneumatic rubber tire roller was used to perform the final rolling after each lift. So this is what the continuous feed paver looks like. Um, so it's operated with one operator in the front, and then there's a person in the back of the machine that's controlling the material coming into the screed box. Um, the trucks, the support trucks, would actually hook up on the left side in the photo here um, to the continuous feed paver. And there is a, um, a green uh, tube, a hose that connects the continuous feed paver to the support units. And those um, hoses supply the emulsion to the continuous feed paver throughout the operation. So as, the, as each truck would back in, it would not only feed material, but also emulsion material. And on top of the micro, feed, uh, micro paver is a uh, pallet of uh, Portland cement. So there was an operator that was on top of the machine that would continuously add Portland cement into the hopper um, to provide the uh, proper mix uh, for the material as it was pro progressing down the roadway. So here's a, a photo of some of the support trucks um, that the uh, suit coat used. Um, they're specially designed trucks that have a hopper um, that continue, that feeds the aggregate. So you'll see the aggregate in the, the middle truck there. Ha, um, there's a bin that the material is stored in. And then on each side of the truck, there are tanks. So in this photo here, it says the, the Metro Mat suit coat micro paving tank. Um, that's where the, the emulsion is, is stored at. And that's what brings the emulsion to the micro uh, paver, the continuous feed paver. So here's a photo of the application. Um, as you can see, the, the material is being applied um, about two foot in width. And in, in the photo, you'll see some glossy surface. And then in the middle of that, you'll see sort of a dull finish. Uh, that dull area is actually where the joint was failing. And that's where the material is actually filling in the joint. So it looks slightly different just the way the sun's hitting in here. But um, as I mentioned, this is a very quick operation. It goes about uh, up to five miles an hour. So it's a, it's a brisk walk as you're following the machine down the road. And here's a couple photos of the uh, first application, uh, the finished application, um, first application, excuse me. Um, so you'll see uh, the photo on the right, you sort of see the, the longitudinal joint seam that was being filled up um, sort of throughout the middle um, of that photo. Um, so this was the first lift, so the, the second lift was placed the, the following day um, and, and overlapped this joint just very slightly.
I apologize, folks. We seem to be having a few technical issues with Dean's connectivity. Um, so we're just going to advance to our next speaker and hopefully we get Dean back here shortly. Um, Okay, so our next speaker um, for today, our last speaker actually is Mike Fleming, uh, who is the Public Works Director uh, for uh, Dover Township in York County. Uh, and he's also a PennDOT Local Technical Assistance Program Instructor. So I'd like to welcome Mike um, to today's presentation. Mike? Okay. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, Mike, and Mike, I will um, have to advance your slides. OK. OK. Uh, well, we're going to talk about uh, paving fabrics today, and uh, we're going to talk about the use of using a paving fabric underneath a chip seal. It was a pilot project here in Dover Township. And uh, with that, go ahead and advance. So uh, there we go. With uh, we know that with paving fabrics, the whole idea is to provide uh, a way to seal out moisture from getting into the roadway. We want to provide a, a relief between the, the pavement below and the pavement on top. And uh, we, we need a bonding agent in there to, to hold that fabric fast to the road. So, um, and, and that's typical if you're using these uh, paving fabrics with uh, super pave overlay or in our case, our pilot project with the chip seal. Next slide, please. So um, my experience with paving fabrics uh, in, in my part of South Central PA was, uh, we always heard the horror stories about paving fabrics and fabrics wrapping around the wheels of pavers and things like that. And, and back in 2013, um, this was 20 years into my career of Public Works, uh, I was over in Elizabethtown Borough over in Lancaster County to see how they use paving fabrics. And uh, you can see that the paver come down the road on top of the paving fabric and made a sharp 90 degree turn. And not at one point did the fabric wrap around the wheels of the paver. Uh, I was very impressed with this. And, uh, and we'll see in the next slide if you can advance to that. Uh, not only did the paver come down the road, but in this, this project this day, there were seven triaxles or uh, tandem axle trucks that came down to uh, dump hot mix into the paver. Um, and you really see no, no issues with the fabric pulling up or being stuck to the wheels of the truck. So, um, you know, at that point, I was a believer that uh, maybe we all need to consider using paving fabrics on our road. And that's where the idea of this uh, this chip seal came into uh, you know to mind. So if you can advance to the next slide. Also, um, after my visit to uh, Lancaster County to see them use paving fabrics, uh, went down to Maryland, and and Maryland had experimented with this before Pennsylvania on using a uh, paving fabric and then a single seal uh, chip on a on a state road. Uh, it's called Basil Avenue. It's uh, outside of Chesapeake City. And um, similar uh, issues that we have here in my township with block cracking. Um, my soils are mostly clay and I have a lot of uh, cracking like you can see in this photo here. But this was the project down in Maryland. And the, the front part of the uh, slide here, um, you can see all the cracks in the pavement. But then beyond here, this is where the fabric started. And um, this was probably uh, three years after this material was put down on this road. You can see there was no cracks that had penetrated through the paving fabric uh, and have you know, caused any problems with the chip seal. So at that point, I was uh, you know, very interested in trying this out. And uh, you can advance to the next slide. You know, we, we know that there's many benefits of using paving paving fabrics. They're going to extend the life of the pavement, um, hopefully stop the reflective cracking from coming up through the finished surface. 
Uh, we want to prevent that water from infiltrating down through. And ultimately, we're going to decrease our road maintenance cost. And the issue that I had with a paving fabric and a chip seal was it was not a PennDOT approved process for those in local government to use. Um, we do have specifications in Pub 408 on using paving fabrics and, and they are approved. Uh, and then also in Pub 408 and Pub 447, we are allowed to do chip seals. Uh, if it's a bituminous chip seal or an asphalt uh, seal coat, um, these are all approved processes, but uh, what I wanted to do was not an actual approved process. So that's why we ended up into this pilot program. If you can advance to the next slide, please. So the, the people that were involved in, in this pilot program, um, uh, Tom Welker from PennDOT Bureau of Planning and Research, because I wanted to use liquid fuels and this was a new, a new concept. Uh, we had to get, uh, you know, approval from uh, planning and also from municipal services. Uh, PennDOT had contracted with uh, Penn State Larson uh, Transportation Institute to do the pilot and to evaluate the project. Um, our township, um, we bid this as an alternate bid to a normal seal coat on our uh, municipal service forms, the MS 944. And uh, through that, we had a couple different bidders, but our lowest bidder was a contractor here from York County and a paving fabric uh, contractor from down in Maryland that we have dealt with previously. So uh, we were ready to go at that point. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. You know, the, uh, the facility at Penn State that was involved in this research project, they're involved in many projects, but uh, you know, the idea here was we wanted to do this in Dover Township um, to, you know, get a real life uh, simulation of what's involved and, and how the fabric would work out. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of my roads are built on a clay uh, soils. So we have a lot of problems with, uh, you know, uh, freezing and thawing and cracking of roadways. And because of that, you know, we asked PennDOT to have uh, have this done as a pilot to get some real traffic involved with cars and trucks. Uh, the road that we did, even though it is a seal coat, there's a fair amount of tractor trailers that travel on that road. And also, you know, I was concerned because I saw some damage um, in the Maryland project where they the snowplow had done some damage at an intersection. So I wanted to see what our what our plows. Uh, how the seal coat was going to hold up the snow plows in winter. So if you can advance, please. Um, you're more than welcome to, to stop and visit our project. Uh, if you Google search uh, 1426 Butter Road in Dover, Pennsylvania, we also provide you the coordinates here. But we did a 1434 foot section. Uh, the roadway is 24 foot wide. And uh, that was where our, that's our project that took place. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, similar to any seal coat, the surface preparation is the same. Uh, any potholes we're going to fix with 19 millimeter, we're going to level up any ruts. Any cracks that are greater than 3 8 inch wide, we would seal with, uh, you know, crack seal material. Uh, the road has to be clean. Um, it must be dry because you're spraying a, a PG uh, emulsion on that roadway or a, a PG uh, performance grade bituminous product on a roadway. So the road has to be dry. And like I say, it's it's similar to any seal coat that we would uh, apply to a road. Next slide, please. So our, our tack, uh, coat that we had sprayed on the roadway. It's a PG 70 minus 22. And um, you can see it was applied over top of the old uh, pavement markings, uh, the center line markings there you can see. And you can see in, uh, if you look close there, there's uh, there's some cracking where the material, you know, went down into the cracks, but uh, that was the, the first part of the process. Next slide. So then we, uh, the, the contractor uh, spread the paving fabric out. Uh, the fabric that we used is the uh, 
the same PennDOT approved fabric that you would use for a super pave uh, uh, project. Uh, this is a PennDOT approved uh, material. There's a couple of them in, uh, in the pub, but the one that we chose and the one that's closest to us, the closest supplier, we use the Mirror Fee MPV 600 uh, geotextile. The day that we did it, uh, the highest pavement temperature that day was 132 degrees. It was a very hot and humid day. Um, but that's the, the first part of the process there where they, they unroll that fabric and there's a squeegee bar here that presses the uh, geotextile into that hot PG uh, material. Next slide, please. So uh, the, fact, the photo on the left here, you can see where once that PG material is sprayed on the roadway and the fabric's put down, immediately you can sort of press your fingers into that uh, fabric and uh, you know you can feel like the cushioning effect and that was one thing that we did notice with this project was the ride was much smoother on the roadway where the fabric went down versus the normal road where we only did the double seal coat um, and a photo in right here uh, you can see we were proceeding up the hill um, the uh, the fabric is is fairly close to the distributor truck. Uh, we don't want that material, that PG material, to cool down too much. Um, and I will say, if you notice in this photo here, and I'll I'll talk about this uh, later on here, where we uh, I'm I'm going to mention we had some blistering. Um, we think it was from the drive wheels of the tractor where it was pulling the fabric on the uh, PG material. But we'll get on to that in a little bit. But uh, this was the roadway, uh, and, and again, I'm, uh, I'm going to stress that we have a lot of clay soils within a thousand feet of this project is one of the oldest uh, brick companies in central PA. Glen Gary has a, a clay quarry, so uh, that quarry is less than a thousand feet from this roadway. So we, we do have our fair share of clay roads that we deal with clay soils. Next slide, please. Um, with this project and with any paving project or whatever, I mean, we do deal with traffic and, uh, you know, even though it was on a rural roadway, uh, we had a resident that needed to get out of his driveway and uh, immediately after the fabric was uh, rolled out and uh, squeegeed in, uh, he was able to drive on the fabric with no issues. And, and in the PennDOT 408 specs, there are provisions that talk about letting traffic drive on the fabric. Uh, we were fortunate in this location that it was a, uh, a rural location, not a lot of traffic that day. We did try to close the roadway um, to through traffic because of the number of uh, people from PennDOT and Larson Institute and uh, contract representatives on site there. So we uh, did try to keep most of the traffic off. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you will notice that um, in the photo on the left, uh, the the tractor that they sprayed spread the uh, fabric out on. If the uh, the operator realizes that he's uh, ta if that tack is coming up through the fabric, they do have sand that they can apply uh, here. They'll they'll throw a handful or shovel full of sand in to absorb any areas where there's a high amount of PG material coming up through the fabric. But within minutes of, uh, of applying the fabric and rolling it out, uh, the contractor was you know, driving and parking on that, uh, that PG or that, uh, that paving fabric. So there was no issues with it sticking to the tires or anything like that. Next slide, please. So then we uh, we applied our uh, seal coat next, and it's right on top of the uh, right on top of the fabric. Uh, standard uh, emulsion application. We followed the Pub 408 specs. Um, in this situation, we did a double application of uh, number eight stone, and I typically do that on. Uh, most roadways, even when we do microsurfacing, we'll do a double application. Uh, it's no different than if I'm painting the shutters on my house. 
I'm going to put two coats of paint on instead of just one coat. So uh, typically I'll do a double application of uh, a chip seal or a microsurfacing. Next slide, please. So with this double application, we're using polymer modified emulsion. Um, we're using a number eight aggregate. It's a pen dot aggregate. And I will comment, you may see in some of the slides here, the roadway looks to be a different color. Um, this was a Monday morning project. Some of the trucks were loaded with stone on Friday afternoon uh, from an, another quarry, another part of the quarry. So some of the finished roadway is a, is a different color. And uh, it was still a number eight aggregate, PennDOT uh, certified aggregate. But uh, here the, the chip spreader is, is applying the first layer of number eight stone. And if you can advance to the next one, please. Um, immediately the rubber tired roller is uh, compacting that stone into the uh, fabric and into the emulsion it's placed there. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. The, uh, we sort of joked about this because uh, prior to uh, another uh, presentation on this, I went out to the job site and I was surprised to see that uh, one of the kids in the municipality was uh, was able to do a burnout on this roadway, a pretty long burnout, and uh, the fabric held up uh, very well. I mean, there was no issues with uh, chips coming off or any fabric exposed, so everything went pretty well on this uh, project. Next slide, please. And. Um, the two photos here, you know, seven months later, we were back. And if you look at the photo on the left hand side here, you can see all the cracks that were in the road. They were minor cracks. Uh, you see the fabric on the roadway here. And then seven months later in the wintertime, um, again, no, no issues with any cracks coming through. And if you go to the next slide, which uh, this photo was just taken about a month ago, the same area it's been over two years now, and there's no cracks that have penetrated up through um, the fabric or the seal coat that's on the roadway. So uh, on the next slide, we're gonna talk about, uh, some people call it, you know, what did this cost you? I don't really refer to it as a cost. It's more investment in the roadway. Um, the fabric is gonna be there until it's milled up, so that's gonna provide that, uh, that waterproof barrier that uh, it's going to keep the moisture from getting through. It's going to stop the cracks from coming up through from the bottom. So I'm referring to as an investment. Um, I'm finding with most of our uh, paving fabric projects, we're paying anywhere from uh, 225 to 250 a square yard. Because this was a small experimental project, the contractor's price was a little bit high, but we're finding that uh, most paving fabric jobs uh, with the MPV 600 material cost us about 250 a square yard. And again, I refer to it as an investment in your roadway, not actually a cost. If you move to the next slide, please. Um, here we had uh, some issues with, I'm gonna refer to them as blisters. Uh, we think we had some groundwater underneath the roadway that's penetrated up through. Um, the contractor came back and applied a PennDOT approved CRASCO uh, patch to those areas. Um, that was the only problem that we've had with the process so far. It appears that the only place it's at was where the tractor tires had uh, uh, driven across the fabric when it was new. In the uh, next slide, um, there's another shot of some of those blisters, but uh, you know, we really have not had any uh, cracks come back. You will see some cracks in this upper part of the photo here, but this is right at the edge. This is the, the edge of the fabric at the bridge at the where we started our project. And the next slide is the last one. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me by email or call us. Uh, we're very pleased with the product and we will use it again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike.
Um, we do have a few questions for Mike. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to stop sharing content so I can go back to where we left off with Dean's presentation. So I'm going to turn over questions to Dan right now, um, and he can ask a few that came in for Mike. Mike, if this process is not approved by PennDOT, can I still do it and use general fund money? Yes, you can. And uh, there's several municipalities that have done it. Uh, some have even applied just a single seal coat application instead of the double that we did. The next question is, is will snow plows damage the fabric and seal coat? We have not experienced any problems with that. I'm sure if your operator uh, plows on the crown of the road, on the top portion of the road, he could damage uh, the seal coat and possibly the fabric, but uh, we have not experienced any problems like that on our pilot project. And then the last question, uh, would Dover Township use fabric on seal coats in the future? Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, like I say, I refer to it as an investment, not necessarily cost, but uh, we feel that fabric not only under the super paved projects that we've done since 2016, all of all of the roads we've paved since 2016 have had fabric. Um, we would definitely use fabric underneath our seal coats in the future. Then actually one more just came in. How does the fabric lay around curves? Uh, along curb lines. Oh, curves, Cur okay. I curves follow. in the road. Yes, um, we have uh, done a fair amount of paving on curvy, windy roads. Um, the fabric is laid out on the roadway and the uh, the installers will use a, uh, uh, a knife to sort of get the uh, angle of the roadway. And as you turn, they can uh, stretch that fabric on one side where it bunches up on the inside. They can stretch it on the outside and there's no problems with uh, going down a windy country road, putting a fabric down. OK, we're going to we're ready to go back to Dean Poletti uh, for his slide in the presentation, so I'll kick it back over to Danielle. Thank you, Dan. We have um, Dean's slides up again. Thank you all for your patience. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Dean to finish his presentation on microsurfacing. Dean. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, sorry about that, that little uh, technical glitch there. Um, so getting back to the microsurfacing, uh, so th this photo here is what the, the first application of the microsurfacing will look like when it went down on just another example. And Danielle, could you advance to the next slide, please? This is what the final product looks like at the end. So we were able to actually have our, our own district paint crews come back in the same day that they apply everything and put the paint lines down before we reopen the traffic. Uh, next slide. So here's a bird's eye view of the 2019 uh, micro edge repair and the 2018 mill and fill repair we did on the same stretch of roadway. So you can see the center line was done uh, with a uh, mill and fill. The edge line was done with the micro surfacing. They look very similar. The micro surfacing is just a little bit narrower of a width um, of, of repair. Next slide. So just to kind of compare and contrast the micro surfacing versus a, a mill and resurface repair. So the micro surfacing, as I mentioned, we work order this into an existing crack sealing contract. Did about nine miles of roadway uh, on the project, about 24 inches in width. Depth of repair was about one to four inches. Um, ranging anywhere from half an inch deep up to eight inches in depth. Uh, we used this, like I mentioned, this was a micro servicing material that we used. Three days to complete the project at a cost about $2.39 a linear foot. One of the big advantages is that there's no, no joints to seal and maintain in the future. Now looking at the mill and uh, resurface repair we did in 2018, that was a standalone project about the same length of roadway, just a little bit longer. Um, with the repair was about 36 inches. We did a two inch deep repair. Same with the distresses. It was a nine and a half millimeter super paved material. It took five days to complete that project at a cost of, of uh, right around $10.13 a linear foot. So that equates to around a, a $372,000 savings of doing microservicing versus a conventional mill and fill on the joints. 
Uh, one of the disadvantages to a melon resurface is now you have two longitudinal joints that you need, need, to, need to seal and maintain. And then just as a, a side note, um, Steve mentioned uh, the hot pour mastics. We got a quote for hot pour mastic on this job before we did the microsurfacing. It was around $5 a linear foot. So the, the microsurfacing still came in about $130,000 cheaper than the, the uh, hot pour mastic. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. So just to sort of wrap up, um, the, the center line and edge line fairs are very common in our pavements. Um, and this microsurfacing could be a very cost effective treatment um, to, to repair those the center line joints and edge line joints. And then once again, we did two different projects on the same stretch of roadway. So we're going to be able to compare um, the, the results moving forward and see which products holding up um, over the long term uh, life of the, the interstate. Next slide. So we expect both of these surface treatments, the mill and fill and the center line. Um, uh, the, I'm sorry, the micro servicing edge joint repair to last at least four years at these locations. Um, just a frequent need to, to do this repair on our, our pavements um, suggests that it should be given good consideration as a normal part of routine maintenance um, on our high level bituminous pavements. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to continue to evaluate the, the cost effectiveness of the uh, the melon fill versus the micro servicing versus the hot pour mastics. And in fact, in this year in 2020, we let a, a uh, hot pour mastic contract for center line and edge line repair, just to see how that compares to what we did with the micro servicing. And the cost of that project was about seven twenty seven dollars and twenty three cents a linear foot um, for doing all five uh, interstates uh, on this project. So uh, the cost per linear foot for, compared to a little over two dollars versus seven dollars is still a pretty good savings um, with the, the micro surfacing. So we're going to evaluate all of our pavements here in District 11 and, and look at around year seven or eight trying to use either a mastic one hot pour type material um, or a micro surfacing around that to try to preserve our joints and extend the life of our pavement. Next slide. So just to, to summarize, once again, my name is Dean Paletti. If there's any questions, my contact information is on the screen, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I know we're, we're short on time here. So I'll open it back up to Danielle and Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. We're going to let Dean uh, catch his breath there a little bit um, uh, for trying to cut off, uh, shed some time off of here today. So um, we do have, I believe, uh, some additional questions for our speakers. Uh, in the chat box. Again, um, we're going to keep that open. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them via the chat box. Um, I will say with regard to Dean's presentation on microsurfacing, we also have an exhibit um, on microsurfacing as part of our virtual exhibit hall um, that I mentioned at the beginning of this session. And again, that's on our event website, www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. Um, so definitely go over and check out um, 50 uh, over 50 uh, innovations that are out there on the exhibit hall. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan. I believe there's a couple questions for Steve Kozar regarding hot for mastics, and we'll see what else we might have gotten in. Uh, Steve, is there a machine specification uh, for hot poor mastics? Uh, we have a uh, the equipment under rental under an agreement, a contract statewide contract that can be used. So that could be used by the state government or locals. OK, next uh, next question. Steve, you said that mastic can be placed uh, four feet wide. Uh, what's the skid resistance of the material? Well, that would be depend if you had uh, used the topping stone uh, not, and then uh, uh, it's a better thing you have with, uh, with crack sealant because crack sealant doesn't have any aggregate at all in it. This at least has aggregate in the mixture itself, and then you put a topping stone over top of it. I mean, it test done since with our existing skid uh, testing equipment would not be feasible because you don't have the distance. So it would be kind of a challenge to do, although there are some continuous friction test uh, 
been available, that that's maybe an option. I think we actually, those, uh, those wide applications would be where you have like an inlet or a round man part. But I was getting some feedback there. I didn't know if someone was asking a question or not. Okay, uh, Dean Paletti, we got a question in for you. Um, can the seam on the edge of the road be moved onto the shoulder or more to eliminate some failure to the road? and direct it more to the shoulder. Uh, so, so the purpose of what we were doing was trying to, to fill and seal that joint. So, I mean, yeah, you can move the, the band slightly left or right to try to get it out of the, the wheel path in, in the area, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily going to move the failure area over. Um, like I said, this was the purpose of the, the sealant is to, to fill the joint and then, then seal on either side of it to prevent a, a failure. So you're going to want to overlap um, as much as you can to catch all the, the areas or areas that are starting to unravel. Um, so it's going to kind of be a case by case basis. I also have one uh, for Josh and Scott. When doing alternative analysis for various pavement repair procedures, is a present worth analysis performed that considers life cycle costs over time? Yeah, so. <clears throat> In PennDOT, when we are looking at our projects, anything over 30,000 square yards of new construction, reconstruction, or rehabilitation, which overlays would fall under rehabilitation, we do perform a life cycle cost analysis that compares user delay costs, traffic control, initial costs, future maintenance, and present worth analysis. Uh, for the smaller projects that's typically not done, it can be done if a district wants to do it. Um, so I guess the answer is yes, uh, when when the project size uh, requires it. Scott, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add. No, no, no nothing else. Steve Kozer, we, we can go back to you. Um, talking about removing uh, of hot floor mastics, um, how would you remove it from the pavement if you can't mill it? No, I, I'm not saying you can't mill it. I'm saying you need, when you, you do mill it, you, you need to be cautious about your equipment. Make it getting kind of gummed up with the naturally weight. Um, the rest of the non plastic being used can be uh, milled and used as a, a wrap material, but where the hot floor mastic is used, you should not be uh, trying because it'll also, depending on the quantity, mess up your asphalt mixture uh, calculations too. So it's 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 best to get it out of there and don't use it, waste it. And the last one we'll get to here, uh, Steve, uh, this one's for you. Is there a process map developed to allow this product to be completed by either department force crews or contract? Uh, for both, no, per se, I would say no. Um, that's, that's a good idea. Um, it is something that, you know, we're, we're first out of the shoot here trying it. So um, we, we could do something like that. Um, for locals and for the department. That's a good idea, actually. Okay, we thank you so much for attending um, the Extending Payment Life session as part of PennDOT's first ever virtual innovation week. Um, I know there are some questions that we didn't get to. Um, we will be following up with our speakers. Um, after uh, the session today uh, to get those answers and we will be distributing them to the participants of this session. Um, I know we also received a question as to whether these sessions are going to be available. We are recording all of the sessions as part of Virtual Innovation Week and we will be making them available on the event website. 
um, probably sometime next week. Again, that event website is www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. Um, also, I will point out uh, after we end today's live session, if you click on the link in the calendar invitation that you received, you will be able to hear the full playback of today's session. Uh, so that is another option available. If you miss parts of today's session, if you click on that link, you'll be able to hear a full playback. Um, with that, we are uh, just after 11 o'clock here. Again, we thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you have an excellent week. Take care.